Oh, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Uh, well, thanks for everybody to be here uh, today. It's um, September 1st, so we're ta really taking it on the first day of the month uh, for the monthly call, uh, which happens every Wednesday, first Wednesday of the month. And uh, um, and I'm going to do what I never do, is introduce myself <laughs> for people who don't know. Um, I'm Fanny, uh, and I um, with the foundation uh, and helping uh, chapters uh, with uh, different things. And maybe we can start with uh, introduction, uh, maybe for the foundation and then any newcomer uh, or anybody who wants to introduce themselves as well uh, would be uh, happy to uh, hear uh, from you. So maybe give the floor to the other woman uh, from the foundation, Angela. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Angela Corpus. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the director of media and partnerships with the foundation and uh, uh, always welcoming uh, new people. So thank you for coming. We're missing uh, uh, Jen uh, uh, Moroni, but we have Matt uh, here. Um... Right. And for those who, who I don't know, my name is uh, Matt Pruitt, uh, president of Radical Exchange Foundation. Um, and um, uh, yeah, looking forward to meeting those of you who I don't already know. Eli? Hi, I'm Eli. I'm the communications assistant at RxC. I help on the side of social media and write and contribute to the blog sometimes. Thank you. And Alex? Hi, I'm Alex Rendaccio. Um, I do a lot of uh, tech stuff at Radical Exchange, including the RxC Voice project. Nice to see you all today. Thank you. And um, um, Glenn, I don't know if we need to uh, introduce um, the founder of the foundation, but yeah, go ahead. Glenn Weil, founder of Radical Exchange. Thank you. Um, well, and um, uh, I wanted to ask if, uh, if uh, it's anybody's uh, uh, first uh, community call, uh, if um, you'd like to also introduce yourself or anybody else. Hello, Marco here. Hey, Marco. Yeah, this is my first call. I will, I will also present uh, later um, uh, a study that I made. So um, I'm a researcher at mechanical uh, faculty of University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, if you know this little country uh, in Central Europe. Uh, and we will we'll speak uh, later more. Great to have you, Marco. I can go ahead. Hi, I'm Francesco, joining from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, working uh, for a think tank called Open Future Foundation, mostly in data governance. It's my first community call, so nice to meet you all. Thanks. Happy to have you, Francesco. Hi everyone, my name is Porter. Um, I read one of Glenn's books and I really liked it. So I thought I should join and say hi to everyone, so. I like that you have the book uh, on <laughs> handy next to you. Anybody else? All right. Well, uh, if you want to just say hi in the chat or uh, or just leave a note, uh, that's uh, that's also great. So, um, so as usual, I think we are. Uh, so for these calls, we really try to uh, have uh, people from the community present like what they're working on or uh, different projects uh, that tie into uh, some research and and work done by uh, Radical Exchange Foundation and uh, and really. Uh, hear from you, get, um, you know, like share ideas, uh, projects, and uh, if you need anything, any help as well, uh, feel free to also use that as a, as a forum. And, uh, and we end the call with some news from the foundation and, and tell you also what's happening on, on our end. And uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if there are um, uh, a lot of people from the chapters uh, today. Um, I know after the summer, um, a lot of chart chapters are uh, trying to really uh, like start again, like not necessarily in person, but 
uh, revamp a little bit what's happening locally with um, chapters and, and, and radical exchange ideas and, and, uh, and you know, collaborating on local issues. Uh, and uh, and projects. I mean, it doesn't have to be issues. And uh, um, yeah, so I don't know if there's anybody um, like Gustavo or uh, someone who is part of a chapter who has any question on uh, on chapters um, that I can or we can answer. Hi. Uh, so I don't have any particular questions. Like um, I have a project that I wanted to to show later. Uh, that we're doing here in Brazil. But um, just to update you all, um, me and Vinicius were leaving Brazil. So like Vinicius is going to France and uh, I'm, I'm in Chicago right now. So uh, like, so the Brazilian chapter will be kind of international uh, uh, like from now on. Um, but uh, yeah, just updating you all. Yeah, this is great. And uh, and I mean, Matt, you can talk about the San Francisco chapter that you also handle from far a little bit. From all the way across the bay in Oakland. <laughs> Not that far, but you know, like I, I think that's important too, though, like note that you don't have to like live in the city that like you might be interested in a, um, like local project in the city, but uh, you know, I'm I'm French, but I live in the U.S., so I'm still interested in following some of the French chapter uh, updates and meetings and and so on. So, uh, so it's a good reminder that it doesn't have to be um, very like you know like like localized. Uh, I would say for uh, for chapters. Um, oh, and Jen uh, Jen joined us uh, as well. So hi hi Jen. Sorry, I was late. Thanks. Hey everyone. So Gustavo, if you um if you'd like to talk about the project you mentioned, that that would be a good time because I think we're we'll um we have a few uh, different uh, projects uh, that we wanted to uh, talk about today. So if you'd like to start, like it's all yours. Okay, great. Uh, I'm gonna share screen. Okay, uh, but I'm I'm not able right now. Can someone give me permission? <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna give you the permission. Should be able to now. Okay, yeah. So can you all see it? Perfect. Okay, so it's it's all in Portuguese, but I think, I mean, you can understand what's going on. Uh, this is a, a um, a version of that budget visualization website from uh, Gov Taiwan that we did. Uh, and the cool thing is that we got to present this at the city council last week. And it's recorded on YouTube if you want to watch it. And a lot of the representatives supported it um, and they want to like institutionalize this and like they're already asking me to do uh, to, to put other values here other information and uh, so the website works very similarly to the original one um, you can see how the expenses uh, you know belong to each um, uh, like um institution within the the city council so all the secretaries uh, you can sort it by function so this is health you know, health was the biggest expense uh during 2020 this is uh the retirement fund education urbanism um you can also sort it by territories so uh, these are different neighborhoods in Sao Paulo and this is this is all just Sao Paulo just my city uh, this is not the entire budget of the Brazilian national government just, this is just for my city um, so yeah uh, and um, we're also 
uh, planning on doing a hackathon so that we can create more projects uh, and uh, get more citizens to participate in this project and uh, improve it and make it more transparent, you know? Um, so yeah, this, this was the, this is the most recent project we're doing here. And yeah, if you have any, uh, you know, tips or if there's anyone who wants to work on this with us, uh, we're very, you know, happy to uh, have you on this. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's an amazing tool. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious how the uh, how did the city council uh, like it? How did they react? Um, so, I mean, they they all really liked it. Uh, we showed in the uh, budget committee. Uh, so there were five uh, representatives in this council, and. Um, so I was, I, I'm doing this work for a specific representative within the, the city council, but then she decided to, you know, turn it into a um, law proposal, like a legislation proposal to, so that the, the city council would incorporate this to their uh, mainstream, uh, you know, uh, transparency portal and uh, uh, data visualization tools. And as soon as I finished uh, presenting this project, the president of the committee was already like, okay, I wanna be a co-author of this project. And, um, uh, and, and I mean, representatives from all, spe from all spectrum uh, wanted to, to be co-authors. So uh, like from the far left to, to the right, you know, like everyone wanted uh, so. I think this was a very unanimous project and uh, everyone really liked it. That's amazing. So there, so I think you answered my question. So they're, they're basically, they're going to pick this up and make this part of their standard sort of transparency practice. Yes, yes. I mean, it's just so cool. Like it, it, it's kind of, I think that's just a, that's like a beautiful illustration of how if you build something that like a government should already be doing and then just show it to them, then they almost have to just <laughs> integrate, you know, take yeah. it in and integrate it, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. And you said you, uh, you used uh, what uh, um, Gov Zero had done in, in Taiwan. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. So um, I, the, the project that I forked, was from a, a group in Italy that uh, had looked at, you know, had known of the, the, the Gov Zero Taiwan project and they did a very similar tool. And so I got their uh, project from GitHub and, and then basically I just made a little modifications. Uh, so there were some uh, bugs that I had to fix and I added a bunch more tabs here um, and then I also had to upload the the Sao Paulo data uh, so uh, yeah that's like I, I just built upon what was already available from these open source projects. Awesome. A lot of people are asking in uh, in the chat for the for the link. I don't know if it's uh, if it's live oh, yeah, yet yeah. or if there's anything you can share. Uh, yeah, that I, would be. Um, this is the link. I don't have a like a pretty domain, but uh, let me who needs pretty in. domains? Yeah. <laughs> I think this one should work for. Oh, sorry. I sent privately to someone. Let me send to others. Okay, this should work for everyone. Great, and uh, and if you have your um, your contacts as well, if uh, anybody's interested in uh, in helping or, or doing similar things for other uh, cities, um, like don't forget to to put your your contact because uh, there's a lot of other applications definitely. 
would also okay. love to chat um, at some point about bringing this to, to other cities. I mean, it's, it's so replicable anywhere where we can get the data. Yeah. Um, we can, uh, we can um, help them help them make it accessible through this. I mean, this is, this is totally amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. All right, this thanks. Is, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, okay. go ahead. No, yeah, I was just going to compliment that, uh, like, this is the idea behind doing a hackathon so that then, you know, other developers from all around the, the country can uh, give it a try and, and create it for their own cities. Yeah, that's it. Let me stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Gustavo. So, um, uh, very, very nice. So, from uh, uh, budget visualization, I think we're um, it's like without any uh, any transition, <laughs> uh, we're gonna go to the cultural uh, applications. Uh, we're very happy we have uh, Ruth um, here uh, on the call. We've done. Uh, a lot of uh, great work in the cultural field uh, with uh, further field and culture stake uh, and is now uh, has applied QV for uh, her last project. So uh, I'm actually very personally interested to know more about the project as well. So uh, Ruth, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I don't have a presentation, I mean, a formal presentation, but okay. we closed our first vote, our first public vote at 12 o'clock uh, British summertime last night. So it's all very fresh for us and we're very excited. Um, we've been working on an uh, app to connect artists, communities and uh, venues around culture in places. And the app uses quadratic voting on the blockchain. Uh, our idea, and we've kind of seen this borne out, uh, Furtherfield, maybe I should say a little bit about Furtherfield just to give some context. So Furtherfield's London's uh, longest running center for art and technology. And our focus is on uh, critical uses of technology and disruption and democratization through this kind of deep exploration and free thinking that artists particularly bring to bring to any space. Um, back in 2017, I co-authored a book called Artists Rethinking the Blockchain, which turned out to be very early, a very early move into the subject. Uh, the reason we were able to do that was because we'd been working with artists who had been taking the internet as their medium and context really since the late 90s. So it meant that we were already working with artists who understood digital technologies as uh, society forming, you know, like who really understood this as a way to change the way we relate to each other, the way power operates, all of this kind of thing. Um, so Culture State came out of our lab, which we opened in 2019 called DECAL, the Decentralized Arts Lab. And this was really looking for kind of artist-led development in Web3 and decentralized technologies for kind of fairer and more dynamic connected cultural ecologies and economies, recognizing that the art world can tend to be very centralized. Uh, the wealth tends to be very centralized. The power tends to be very centralized. And we run this gallery in the heart of Finsbury Park uh, in North London. Not that the, this park is a uh, super diverse, like even for London, it's a super diverse area in terms of ethnicities, um, socioeconomic backgrounds, access to education and opportunity. And what we wanted to do, having been running this gallery in this park for 10 years, was to flip our model. So we have for the last 10 years been kind of funneling what we saw as leading international critical art dealing with society like the network society into this local place and we were starting to realize just how much uh, intelligence uh, what cultural what cultural assets we were surrounded by already in our place and we wanted to flip it and turn it out the other way so we've created an app that allows venues to offer 
taster experiences. So we, as a digital arts organization, we created uh, three digital artworks that could be accessed from the park. We called it the People's Park Plinth. So we've turned the whole park into a plinth for art. And then we invited people to use our app to vote for the work that they felt most belonged in the park. And we gave them a number, when, once they'd selected the work that they wanted to support, they then chose from three questions about what was most important, what was most meaningful to them about those works. And it was important for us, like quadratic voting was important to us because uh, we like art, people like art with their hearts and their guts. And therefore it's important that people are able to kind of engage with what we've been calling like an economy of emotion. So they're really kind of considering how strongly they feel both about the works and and, and really reflecting on why they feel the way they feel about artworks. So it's trying to create both a more, a richer relationship with, between artists, audience and venues, and also putting that data by recording this on the blockchain. And our next piece of work is to do some uh, kind of peer driven data visualization around this. But the idea is to put this kind of a data commons about what means most to people and what matters most to people in a place into the public domain. So we ran our first vote. We ran a two week vote that ended last night. The artworks have been on display all summer. We ran a series of public voting events uh, that we ran a series of public voting events on site so that people who didn't have the digital tools could come and experience things. We set up, uh, we had a lo location based voting booth where people could come and learn more about it and learn more about QV. And um, we, it's been a learning experience. Um, we have definitely have work to do on the interface. I'm actually really proud of the work that we did on the QV interface. It's quite playful and quite cute. And we wanted it to be something that felt fun for people to engage with. Um, the thing we discovered, and this is the last thing I think that I should say, the thing that we discovered that was really interesting is that what, when you engage people in questions about culture, moving them from the experience of the work to then sharing their views of the work is quite a complex thing to do within a digital interface. So they were experiencing three different AR works in a physical place. Then we were asking them to go to this app and decide about the thing that they wanted. It's actually putting quite heavy load on people. And I think there's some really interesting work here about how you move people into a space where they're experiencing something, thinking about considering their experience and then working out what it is that they want to decide about it. Ah, oh, one, sorry, one really crucial piece of information. Our, vote, our voting app is uh, location weighted. So uh, if you're based in our park, your vote is worth one and a half times that of someone who isn't based in the park, but lives in London. And another one and a half times more important than someone who lives in the UK and another one and a half times more important than someone who lives elsewhere in the world. Because it feels, and the kind of message behind this is that people should have more say over the things that most affect them. And this is that I'm really curious to see what, once we've done our analysis of the data, what this is going to kind of help us to understand about what's happening there and about how people are relating to the choices they make. Thanks a lot, uh, Ruth. It's, uh, my vote was definitely not uh, that high. <laughs> one, one quick question, Ruth, which is the thing you said about moving people from the experience to the choice was fascinating. And I think it's something that affects not just cultural, but also political issues. Like one thing that wasn't in Radical Exchange Voice, but that is very important in V Taiwan, is like a process of emo like gathering people's emotions around things to even start to form the seeds. And I wonder whether there's some parallels there to be explored and like what the two domains can learn from each other, but. 
I'd, I'd be interested in doing that. I mean, we, we all, all the time, the work that we're doing is trying to make as much room for people's experience of the work and the experience of their reflection and to distract them as little as possible with trying to work out what an interface means. And a lot of that is about trying to find the right questions. So in this project, the three questions we asked people were um, that we asked them to rank the things that were most meaningful to them about the work that they chose. And we said, was it, did it make you see the park differently? Uh, did it address more than one of your senses? Or did it address issues that are important to you and your communities? And so already in that process, we're already kind of directing people's or, or framing people's experience of the artwork through these three different strands. And that, that it's just so interesting, this question of like how you ask a question is already such a strong kind of uh, framing, such a strong that kind of it's a, it's, it's a power move in itself. And these, this is what's really interesting in this stuff for us. Thanks. It's uh, it's definitely. Uh, um, I mean, you really found a way to ask the questions. And I remember by when I uh, when I answered these questions, I uh, I realized that this is the first time someone ever asked me formally how I feel uh, in front of an artwork when you think like especially in art this is the main um, question right so um, but definitely the question um, how did you uh, uh, write the questions like did you do it as a committee like did you spend a lot of time uh, on it or or did you um, you know like how, how did you formalize the questions because I think most of the time this is you know, the, the way you ask the question impacts the answers. Yeah, I mean, this time we did it by, so we first we curated the artworks based probably on just 10 years of experience. So it's a kind of, that's already quite a feely process. And then um, we derived the questions from the work and the works were made in collaboration with park communities most of them I think yeah no all three of them were and then we worked with our team to just whittle them down and try and so we had about five or six of us all of whom work in the park um, I think it would be really I'm really interested in doing as much of this work with the communities themselves it's about making pathways to people to, to kind of involve them as much. I'm also like when it comes to how we visualize the data that comes out of this, it's going to be really important that we work with different people in the community to understand what's important for them to see, what's exposing as well, because it would be very like we're really keen that this doesn't become like just another popularity contest. It has to be about uh, we do, we're not interested in creating more competition between artists. We're really interested in finding ways for people to choose the things that they want that are meaningful to them. So like negotiating, negotiating those things is really interesting as well. And I think just it'll be a, a, cre a creative, is that a word? I don't know. It'll, it'll accrue, uh, I don't know what the word is. We will work it out as we go along, as the project develops, the more different people we work with in different places. But I think we have to always be working with people on the ground to work out what the questions are, work out what the works should be, work out what the process should be, work out what the data should look like. Thank you. Is there any other questions for now for Ruth? Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, there's a lot of links uh, uh, that we, you and other people put in the in the chat. So um, definitely um, something we can all take uh, uh, inspiration uh, from. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, if there's no more question for Ruth, I think uh, uh, Marco had um, an interesting uh, subject he wanted to um, talk about, uh, and I will let you. Uh, introduce it i will uh, not say anything <laughs> okay thank you for the uh for, the, for your time 
Um, my name is Marco, as I said in, uh, at the beginning of, the, of this meeting, uh, and I will present you the uh, Herberger tax policies uh, and how are, are they can be included in, in prediction markets. This is uh, this topic is how do I say maybe it's not it's not so community oriented for for now, but it is a, a part of uh, this idea is a part of radical markets. Um, especially this partial common ownership is just a, which I found um, earlier it's just another word for hybrid and tax. Uh, it's basically the same stuff. Um, and it addresses uh, the issue of property is uh, monopoly. Uh, so I will just share a presentation now. Um, I think Matt has to give you the, the right. I'm with Okay, good. Sorry. Okay. You should yeah, be able okay. to share. Yeah, yeah. Do you see it? Or, uh, here. Wrong screen. So. Yeah, now it is. Uh, you, you see? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but. Okay, um, so um, at first, I don't know how, um, how familiar are you with the topic of prediction markets, uh, but prediction markets in general uh, are trying to um, predict outcomes of certain events, okay? This, uh, this topic is, um, is, is aimed at the um, crypto market or crypto assets so I will just um, I will simplify this uh, for the for the usage in the in the crypto in the crypto space. Okay. So um, first we will we'll take a look what the prediction market is. So we have a, we have a, an asset, which um, and an asset price. Let's say Ethereum uh, in the price of uh, Dai or something something uh, decentralized. Okay, and uh, we have uh, past values. And a current value, uh, which is um, which is the price that is currently available on the market, uh, and this this uh, point in time is called price discovery because here the price is determined um, on the exchanges. Okay, so from this point now, uh, further in future, we don't know what the price will be, um, and all this all this um, this line that is here um, drawn is just one example of price prediction. Okay, so in general, people uh, would like to uh, to make some predictions to hedge themselves against volatility of the crypto assets, especially crypto assets because they're highly volatile. But in general, it's like a, some sort of the people would like to make some sort of insurance against this. Okay, if you imagine if you are I don't know a miner of uh, mining some some uh, coins. Uh, if the price falls below uh, so some some level, you are in a, your balance uh, won't uh, won't be uh, will be negative. So uh, it's better to take some insurance or something like this to cover cover the losses. Okay, um, and uh, now the how how to include Habberger tax policies into prediction markets. This was, a, this was a very interesting thing for me um, because I found Herbert tax uh, policies, I know, three, five years ago, and then it just stuck, stuck in my head. And I didn't, I didn't um, the practical implementation of Herbert tax was um, proposed to, to be used on the real assets uh, like um, property. Um, so um, this uh, implementation of this uh, policy was never, um, it was never implemented or even tested, I think, in the in the real world because it's uh, too radical. Um, so I I I was um, I was thinking how to implement those uh, those policies in some other area, and I found that prediction markets are the best to the uh, the best fit I currently see. So um, if we if we um, try to implement hybrid tax in prediction market. First, uh, what we do is the future, the future, uh, so the possibility, the possible prices in the future represents our virtual land. So, this is this is all the options that the future price can uh, can be. Okay. So um, first, we, we we define this uh, fu these future prices as, as uh, virtual land. Okay. 
Then uh, this virtual land is uh, divided into frames, uh, like vertical. And inside of those uh, frames uh, are um, horizontally divided into parcels. So these are parcels, and these are uh, these be, these parcels becomes uh, an asset that can be um, that can be uh, traded or that is a subject of the Herbridge Her tax. Okay, it's it's the same as the um, normal um, property like house or, and um, and other stuff, but it is a virtual land. So it's not it's not it's not really just a, just some. Um, Marco, future, just, uh, future just wanted to check, like you're still uh, showing like the first slide that's hardware tax and prediction markets. Just wanted to make huh? sure you're not talking over uh, slides. You don't, you don't, don't see. Uh -huh. you don't see. We just uh -huh. see like that, uh, that first slide with your name. Yeah, okay, okay, that's, it's, okay, that's strange. Um, maybe here. Okay, I, I, yeah. I think. Now it's good. Uh -huh. Now it's good. Okay. Now it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I just change it. I have multiple screens. Okay, it's, it's ah, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, this is how you, you didn't see this picture. No, but you can uh, go, uh, okay, back, okay, okay. go go yeah. back. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just I'll go, go back. Go I'll go back. Okay, this is the future. This this is the potential prices, uh, and we, we create this virtual land and uh, vertically divide uh, this um, uh, so, uh, this land into frames and uh, horizontally divide again to produce parcels. So each parcel has a top price, a bottom price, start time and end time. Okay, and this, this is an asset uh, that can be used in the Herbergen text uh, policies. Okay, uh, so how do we use this, uh, this, uh, these assets to predict or to hedge against uh, price volatility? So a user purchase a parcel, okay? Uh, user decides that this is the future, this uh, should be a, or this is a, this, um, he bets that this is the future value of, this will be the future value of the, of the underlying asset. So he purchased this parcel. Okay. Uh, he then sets an acquisition price. This means this is the price for, uh, for which he is obliged to sell. Okay. According to the policy and uh, pays tax proportional to acquisition price and duration of ownership. So he will pay tax until end of, until this parcel runs out. So time goes in this direction. So uh, when, the, when, the, when the time flies, it, this, uh, this parcel moves closer to current time, which means that uh, after it, it won't, it won't be useful anymore. Okay, this is because if you, if we, see, uh, if we look at this uh, chart, okay. Uh, what is the incentive? How the how the incentives work, or how the um, the distribution of uh, of taxes uh, implemented here? So for each for each frame, so for each vertical division of uh, mutual land, uh, we are collecting taxes from all users. So all users that that bought per, uh, parcel in in a in a frame. They are uh, the tax is collected in a pool for the frame, okay? And uh, this uh, collected uh, tax then represents a reward for the one who will be uh, who will won at the end when the frame will end. So let's say this is the Tuesday uh, frame; it will uh, end in Tuesday. So at the uh, at the at the Tuesday midnight, let's say uh, user one will will win, okay? And he will gather all the reward from the pool. Okay, so here is an, uh, an example. So user one, uh, the price is at the, at the location of parcel one. So the user one uh, collects all the rewards from all other, uh, from all other users that paid tax uh, to this, um, uh, into this pool, okay? Um, this is the and the second the second um, possibility for the user to make to make um, to to make predict to be, to use this uh, prediction market is um, in the form of hedging. So hedging is usually uh, usually uh, a way how to how to bet against um, non probably odds. So something that you don't like you have you, you would like to bet against it. Okay. So in um, in normal conditions, uh, in in general, the price, uh, the future prediction of price, the more that is um, 
distant from the current time, the more difficult it is to predict. Okay, so this is represented by this triangle here. So further than we go from the current price, the possibility uh, of the, possi the probability rises. Okay, so uncertainty rises. So Hedger, uh, a Hedger places a wager way in front and at some prices that, that uh, he doesn't expect to, to come. He doesn't want to, for price to be uh, in this range because he's hedging against this range. So he places a, a, he, a, he buys a parcel here. And uh, on the other hand, you have a speculators that want to guess the right price because they want to win. Okay, so the spec, speculators then uh, counter, counter wager, how to say, um, to this hedger. And when the time progress, those uh, parcels are being, uh, are being resold. So if the price uh, suddenly uh, goes down to here, uh, the, the parcel of the hedger will be, will be uh, worth um, more because the probability of winning will be higher. So he would actually, she could actually sell for the acquisition price. He sets the conditions to sell, okay? Maybe it's a little bit confusing, yeah, but... Uh... <laughs> now, this is a very uh, interesting project, uh, Marco. Uh, uh, I just uh, want to yeah. be mindful. We have uh, a few uh, other projects yeah. uh, to yeah, mention yeah, yeah. in the last 15 minutes. So, but, uh, but, but yeah. if you can summarize and then like, uh, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. it's, it's, we can have I'm, a few I'm, questions. Yeah. I'm at the end. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I posted a white paper uh, called During Hedge a Decentralized Market Prediction Platform on ArcSype. It's, so it's open, open and accessible to everyone. Uh, for more information, you can read this white paper. And um, I also made a, a Telegram group, uh, UniHedge. Uh, so uh, you could join and uh, we can discuss further about this project. Okay, this project is aimed to be at the end, this concept is, uh, is planned to be integrated into um, decentralized application. And it will be, it will launch, I don't know, it, it depends, uh, okay. Uh, but uh, first of all, this is a very, this is a new concept. I, uh, and we are, we are currently just um, developing a minimal, a minimal viable product and would like to, have your comments on this subject. Um, do you see any potential uh, downsides or upsides or how, how do you feel about this, about this stuff? Okay, thank you. I will, I will post links uh, in, the, in the chat, okay? Thanks for sharing, it's really interesting, Marco. Looking forward to reading the white paper. Uh, okay. Yeah, please add your contact as well, so we can uh, we can keep in touch. Uh, and uh, and thanks for uh, uh, yeah. for mentioning it. Uh, and uh, I think so. Uh, I'd like to combine two um, different, uh, I mean, two um, agenda items uh, and uh, about the uh, Data Freedom Act uh, uh, open letter um, and have Matt uh, maybe summarize a little bit, like the. Um, um, the letter and uh, and the idea behind the letter and uh, Alisa had uh, uh, some comments and uh, we were not going to cover everything uh, on this call but I think that would be useful for everybody to uh, to hear uh, this uh, as well. So uh, Matt, do you mind giving us some uh, uh, some more details? Sure. So this is a um, we. Uh... We started circulating this um, this open letter a little while ago through the um, through a um, a working group that we've that we've had on uh, on data policy. Um, we're calling this a, an open letter on data governance and democracy. And what what it does is it it essentially attempts to to uh, summarize kind of a rough consensus uh, between a lot of different. Um, experts who are kind of engaged in this topic of, uh, of shared governance of data. Um, uh, what it does is it, 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 it captures some of the insights that were in this longer piece of work we put together a while ago called the, called the Data Freedom Act, and essentially explains that, um, that 
for the future of data governance, what we need are really structures for through which people can um, uh, can combine their interests and make uh, collective decisions about what their data uh, should be used for. And that we essentially, we need to go in this kind of shared governance of data direction, as opposed to, um, as opposed to the idea of, of uh, highly individualized decision-making and governance around data. Um, there's a lot to say about the sort of reasoning behind this, but it, it essentially just draws on these, on these uh, deeper ideas about the, the, the fact that uh, every individual's data sheds light on the, on the data and the information about all the people around them. So that if we're all just kind of making atomized decisions about who to convey our data to and who to negotiate with, then we have this sort of massive uh, collective action failure, uh, you know, none of us has any bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis third parties who are pooling the data of lots and lots of people. So we, you know, in order to sort of shift the, shift the balance of, of, of bargaining power and shift the balance of power in the data economy, we need systems that allow us to, uh, to combine our interests in flexible, uh, you know, well-regulated democratic ways. Um, so th this letter essentially just tries to capture that rough insight um, and send a signal to other people in this space, including policymakers, that this general direction, you know, of sort of data cooperatives, data trusts, data coalitions, shared governance of data is a direction that the space needs to move into. Um, and, you know, hope, ho our, our hope is that this will get the attention of, of folks who are kind of uh, trying to um, or, or, or still stuck in a highly individualistic mindset around how data should be governed. Um, and uh, uh, so we've gotten, we, you know, we, we've got a lot of like prominent names uh, on this letter already, uh, which you can, you can take a look at the, um, at the, the link that I already posted in the chat. Um, yes. uh, I did. Yeah. So you can, you can check out the link there, see, see the names that are already on it, but but basically, we you know we'd love to get the the everyone's names on it. So we you know we we um, basically just let us know directly if you'd like your your name to be to be added to the letter. We we really hope to get like the whole radical exchange community, um, or you know as as much of it as we as we can get as much of it as as is interested in sort of putting its names on this to uh, um, to do so, and. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, over the next few months, we will uh, hopefully, you know, have some, we'll start having some conversations with, with journalists and get some, get some media attention on this idea. Um, and so it would be, yeah, uh, looking forward to, you know, basically having conversations about it. And if you'd like to put your name on, um, uh, just let us know. Yeah, Alisa, I don't know if I, um, if you're uh, if you're in a too crowded uh, uh, space, but uh, uh, you posted your comments uh, uh, about the letter. But if if you if you'd like to uh, uh, to say something, or, or I know you you and Matt have been in contact already. Um, up to you. <laughs> Or just if anyone has any sort of questions or, or thoughts about 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 this, uh, you know, would, would would love to answer them. Maybe Alex, if you uh, if you can give more details, uh, I said like to reach out to Matt to to uh, add your name, but uh, you mentioned a few uh, other way to sign the letter. Yeah, if you click that link that Matt provided to the actual letter on our website, you'll see uh, you'll see on it a, a button to sign the letter on GitHub and a button to sign it via Twitter. So that's a that's a real easy way to do it, and we'll add you as soon as possible. You know, we're we're just kind of adding people by batch every couple of days. Are there, are there any other comments or uh, I, I know Alisa, you have a, 
uh, a longer comment uh, and I'm sure we'll take that offline uh, uh, with Matt or uh, in a longer discussion. Uh, hopefully we can also plan uh, some dedicated uh, time to uh, uh, to answer questions on, on the letter and, and talk a bit more in depth uh, about the ideas uh, in it. Um, and um, but thanks a lot for uh, spending the time and, and thinking about it. Uh, Matt, anything uh, <laughs> else on the letter? Um, I, that's it for that's it for today. There's obviously lots of lots of long conversations to be had about about the letter and about data, but um, but yeah, that's enough okay. enough airtime for me. Um, maybe I'll give the mic to uh, Angela uh, for uh, a few uh, updates um, uh, related to um, some new content and and upcoming things uh, with uh, Radical Exchange. Um, I guess just a, a few things. We do have our, um, in December, and Matt can also talk about this, or Jen, um, I just wanted to have on everyone's schedule, we are having a our annual conference in December. Um, just letting everyone know to mark their calendars. Uh, it's going to come in three parts. Uh, basically, all of December is Radical Exchange Month, but the first weekend, uh, we are going to have a two-parter, which is going to be on the Friday and Saturday of that um, of that weekend, which I believe is the third and fourth or the fourth and fifth. But it's going to be a, a RxC TV day, which is our an ongoing uh, three-hour. So there's actually nine hours of content, premium content that uh, we are producing in-house on a lot of these ideas uh our theme for the whole conference is the new era of democracy so a lot of these new ideas a lot of these new tools we'll be discussing there a lot of thought leaders um are going to be you know in in these uh produced type of pieces so uh look out for that and then also the first location is going to be in taiwan um hopefully in person the second weekend, we're gonna have um, online. And then the third weekend we are going to have in Denver, Colorado. So a lot of US-based folks can uh, hopefully uh, be there and we'll be able to have all these in person. And the um, the conferences, the, the uh, so, Essentially, there'll be these sort of three consecutive weekends with with radical exchange events. Uh, the the first weekend in in Taiwan, e each one of them will have will 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 release some of this this content or bring together the RxC TV, and then and then there will be um, like open attendee led uh, unconferences. So you will, the first one will be in 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 Taiwan. The the second one will be will be online on on Kiko Chat, so that like the whole the whole global community can participate and lead, lead sessions together and uh, and and connect uh, online, and then the that that's the weekend of uh, like December tenth uh, eleventh, and then the the Colorado event on uh, December seventeenth, coronavirus permitting, uh, will you know again be uh, a, um, a attendee led on conference so we're we're we've, we've we're working with some of the some of the people who have been leading these uh on conference uh events uh really successfully for a couple of decades uh through the internet identity workshop um and we're we're excited about uh um about trying this out as a way of uh of kind of you know rethinking the way we way we convene and have conversations so more more information and sort of sign up info uh, soon, but uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, interacting with uh, with all of you all through these. Thank you. Um, and then um, and maybe Eli, uh, do you want to uh, mention the two new uh, essays uh, that are up on the on the website? Yeah. So. Everyone, when you have a chance, check out the Radical Exchange blog because I've got two different um, 
long form essays about different political structures in New York City. One is um, ranked choice voting, how that could potentially relate to quadratic voting. And then another is New York City's public matching funds program for like political candidates, how that could relate to quadratic, like quadratic funding. So uh, yeah, the second one just published this morning. So take a look. And if you want to criticize them, I'd love to hear it. So yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. We had a lot of uh, different projects uh, today. Uh, so uh, it just uh, might be mindful of the time. We just have one minute left. So it doesn't a lot of time uh, if um, anybody else had any uh, other projects or uh, anything to, uh, uh, to share. But I, I, I do still want to uh, ask the floor if, um, if anybody had anything else to share uh, before we close. And you can't hear, but I hear the, the, the church with the bells, which means it's, it's the hour, I guess. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we, you know, again, like if you uh, um, feel free to reach out uh, between the calls, like the calls is just a check, uh, check up or check in um, uh, once in a, in a month, definitely not enough to have uh, all the conversations we need to have. But uh, thanks a lot to everybody who, uh, who uh, were, showed up and, and presented their projects. Uh, uh, really happy to, uh, uh, to, to hear about all of that. So thanks a lot and now uh, see you soon. Bye guys. Thanks everyone.